Hello ladies and gentlemen, um, happy Friday to you. Uh, my name is Simon Timpley from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. Today we have a speaker, Janine Curl, uh, who's the Food Labeling Regulatory Compliance Consultant from, from Food Labeling Matters. Uh, Janine is from Sydney, Australia and uh, it's 2 a.m. in the morning there so hats off to Janine for uh, being able to stay up. Uh, we're really pleased that she can join us today. Janine's going to be talking about uh, food fraud uh, with a particular uh, slant on Australian, uh, some, some case studies let's say from, from uh, Australia but it's really relevant to the wider uh, global food safety community. Uh, food fraud is a huge uh, growing issue. I know at the GFSI conference uh, this week in Malaysia, food fraud was a, a hot topic on, on their agenda. So we're really looking forward to that. Uh, as the regulars know, we're relying on technology today. We're live streaming video, so we're pushing the boundaries. So hopefully everything will go okay. If not, it is being recorded and we do have an edit button so we can uh, uh, edit out any problems hopefully. So it's great to be here again today. Uh, it's free of charge, all of this is free of charge, uh, live webinars, uh, free training, bite-sized uh, education, you get the, a certificate and you get the slides and you get a video recording, absolutely fabulous. Uh, Janine's like I say getting up at 2 a.m. to be with us today uh, free of charge and we've got some sponsors who are helping uh, to deliver this, IFS, Safe Food 360, FSSC and Trace Analytics, so thanks very much to those for supporting us and helping to keep this free for all of you lovely people. Okay, so um, I'll just now introduce you to Janine, I can see Janine's there, welcome Janine, nice to see you. Hello there, nice to see you, Yeah. everybody. Yeah, we have, uh, sorry Janine, we have a, a hundred and over a hundred people in the room now, so while you get your presentation ready, I'll, I'll just inform the um, attendees about next week's webinar, if that's okay, so we'll be back with you shortly, Janine. Okay. Okay, uh, ladies and gents, uh, we've, uh, next week we have, uh, I'm going to try and get this right, because I have practiced, we have got uh, Vladimir Serchinsky from Serbia uh, and uh, Vladimir is going to be talking about uh, food safety trainings, emergency preparedness and response. We all have huge manuals, huge tomes of paper on our shelves, uh, lovely procedures uh, on all sorts of things and one of those is emer should be emergency prepared pre preparedness. I can't even say it. Um, but often it's not trained out, it's not um, uh, trained out throughout the organization at all levels so that in the event of an emergency everybody knows what they're doing. Um, so uh, Vladimir is going to be talking to us about that next week so we, we're looking forward to some tips there. Okay, I can see um, Janine's got a presentation ready. So we'll be going over there shortly. I just want to draw your attention to, uh, we've got a poll running here at the top. If you go to the poll tab, uh, the question is, this week's question is, does your business have a food fraud mitigation strategy? Uh, so if you could um, at some point during uh, Janine's presentation um, answer the poll and we'll um, uncover those answers later uh, during the questions and answers. So I'll be back for the Q&A afterwards, uh, but for now I'll hand you over to Janine. Okay. Okay. Hello. Good evening everybody. Um, 2 a.m. in Sydney, but um, I hope that I'm not too tired to do this. All right. Food fraud. What is food fraud? In this presentation I'm hoping to provide an overview of food fraud and the developments in attempts to control it. I'll look at the development of definitions in the United States and in the, Uni in the European Union and information regarding incidents and common characteristics. I'll take you through some of the Australian matters that could satisfy the definitions that are developing elsewhere for food fraud and I'll look at some international initiatives and responses 
And finally, I'll consider some of the tips for mitigation of food fraud and the food supply for your business. So, what is food fraud? <clears throat> Although we've had um, contemporary food fraud events in a complex food safety chains, and these have been greater potential to impact global consumers globally, the phenomenon is not modern. In 1820, the German analytical chemist Frederick Ackham identified foods uh, adulterants for enhancing yields, tastes or appearances and applicable detention methods and stated, of all the frauds practiced by mercenary dealers, there is none more reprehensible and at the same time more prevalent than the sophistication of the various articles of food. That came from his book in 1820. At that time, food was adulterated using techniques such as coffee adulterated with potato flour, roasted wheat and chicory to increase weight, so color, colouring che red cheeses with red lead, adulteration of cream with rice powder, just to name a few. So food fraud is a commonly adopted terminology for discussing intentional deception in the sale, advertising or labelling of food or food ingredients to achieve an economic benefit. The phrase signifies conduct of operators within the food industry intentionally adulterating, substituting, diluting, mixing or adding substances or ingredients to food represented by statements or visuals or in advertising as being of a particular kind in a manner that falsely represents the authenticity, value, safety or perceived quality of the food for an economic gain and generally characterised by common themes and distinguished from food related incidents involving the unintentional introduction of microbiological, physical, physical or chemical hazards to food, international scholars are defining the public health threat of food fraud, analysing data for trends, advocating for a shift in strategic focus from a detection and intervention to a proactive prevention and developing systems to control food alter adulteration. Now, um, two uh, researchers, John Spink and Douglas Moyer from Michigan State University, have set through, um, done a lot of work in regards to food fraud, and this is their definition. Looking at another definition we've got in the UK, this was applied by Professor Elliott in the Elliott Review, released in December 2014. This was a review of the, of the um, systems in the UK to, um, and, and through that report it was identified that there's a lot of controls in relation to chemical microbiological contamination, but much less attention has been focused on food authenticity. The Global Food Safety Initiative have this little um, image that provides some sort of characterization of different kinds of food fraud and I just wanted to put it up to to demonstrate that there's a, the substitution and the concealment, mislabeling, or counterfeiting or dilution and there are a few examples there and in a couple of slides forward I'll go through some of the more common foods. In January 2004 the European Parliament adopted a resolution based on a report of the committee um, investigating the issue of food fraud and emphasis on the definition and scope and the factors contributing to its occurrence. Um, the resolution has been unanimously adopted by 58 EC members and requires a harmonised definition at EU level. This is one of the most important things that, that through my research of food fraud is actually coming up with a definition. Now the European Union had actually adopted the um, or adopting in the developing definition of Spink and Moyer from Michigan State University, but they've actually the European Union have have worked um, been able to do a lot of work from the work of Michigan State University. And the resolution considers that official control should focus not only on food safety issues but also on preventing fraud and on the risks of consumers being misled. And it notes that there are concerns that there are signals indicating a number of cases arising and various recent food fraud cases have exposed different types of food fraud. The resolution is requiring that um, the, the requirements for carrying out of control should be risk-based. 
um, and it, it flags the first um, raising the issue of developing risk profiles and vulnerability assessments for a supply chain, which is what um, GFSI have. Uh, I'll speak to um, later on. So this is a hundred years old from the New York Evening Post. I like I like this. Generally, not much is really known, but it looks like nothing has really changed. I mean, I'll look at some of the data from around the world. So in early 2013, we had the horse meat scandal reporting 37% of hamburger meat tested positive for equine DNA in the in Ireland. The extent of the beef products affected an associated reduction in consumer confidence brought forward that Elliott review, which I referred to earlier. The, the, now in the UK, the National Audit Office has noted that reports of fraud on the National Fraud Database is up two-thirds since 2009 and a UK consumer group is running an awareness campaign in regards to food fraud for meats, um, identifying that um, up to 40% of lamb takeaways in the UK have um, been contained other meats other than lamb. It's not known con uh, conclusively how widespread food fraud is in the United States. Um, but the collaborative works of the researchers John Spink and Douglas Moyer, um, analysing and characterising food fraud in incidents have contributed significantly to understanding in Europe. In a two-year seafood fraud investigation in the US, Oceana sampled produce from 21 states and reported that 59% of tuna had been mislabeled, 44% of all retail outlets visited sold mislabeled fish and, and almost 74% of seafood sold in sushi restaurants in the US are mislabeled. Now the discovery in 2008 of the adulteration of dairy products in China with the nitrogen rich, rich industrial chemical melamine it's one of the most widely cited examples of food fraud of ingredients due in part to the spectacular realisation of the food um, safety risk. The adulteration of milk products was detected following the increase in babies and children presenting with kidney stones. The melamine and the dairy products case is also significant from um, the researchers' perspectives the failure of the operating food safety management system to identify this substance. Until the incident had become public, the methods for protein measurement relied on the total nitrogen determination as a marker to estimate the protein content of dairy products. The methods did not distinguish between non-protein and protein source nitrogen, ensuring melamine adulterated diluted milk satisfied protein concentration levels required by the QA control systems. So when the scandal broke in 2008, there were 31 standards in total in China to govern the production, processing and distribution of milk, but no standard mentioned the testing of melamine. And this had been actually developed in 2008. So we have melamine as being a known controlled food safety threat, um, where according to researchers more, the lack of analytical se selective selectivity for food protein and the potential for adulteration with non-protein -pro nitrogen had actually been appreciated since at least the middle of the 19th, of 20th century. The evidence suggests that the industrial chemical compound was a known potential food safety threat having been found in fish mill in the 1980s. Contamination of commercial animal feed with melamine and so uranic acid had reportedly caused the death of thousands of juvenile pigs in Thailand in mid-2007. Published before the 2008 melamine outbreak, an analysis of outbreaks of renal failure in cats and dogs in both 2004 and 2007 concluded both outbreaks originated from the same cause, the contamination of wheat flour with melamine and uranic acid. Vulnerable members of society, cats, dogs, babies, and children were the proverbial canaries, or according to Marianne Nestle, the chihuahuas in the coal mine, warning of the safety hazards of globalization of food supply.
This is a really great diagram that's produced by USP in the United States, which um, provides a great overview of the data existing in relation to the most um, susceptible foods for food fraud. And this has come from a, um, a collaboration um, of a number of researchers who then published the, the, the um, analysed data. Um, it would get, there was over a thousand incidents that had been reviewed um, and these this is how it's how um, the foods have actually appeared where we've got milk, olive oil, honey, saffron, fish, all in descending order of, of potential um, food fraud vulnerability. Um, fish and coffee, orange juice, apple juice, black pepper and tea. Um, where you've got milk has been adulterated with vegetable oil, whey, buffalo milk protein, melamine, formaldehyde, caustic soda, detergent, cane sugar. These are all identified actual cases that have been compiled by the UPS, USP. Sorry. Now, an interesting concern in regards to seafood um, has revealed that all studies that are investigating seafood fraud have always found that not a seafood sing seafood substitution study has reported a zero fraud. And a current review of the literature re relating to seafood fraud found ranges from 1% to 100%. From that analysing of that data of U USP, um, Evan Stein had actually identified food fraud characteristics, common characteristics um, from all of those indicated, all, all of those actual um, cases that had been compiled by USP. So you have the, the so, it's so important that we have analytical methods that are, that are specific and effective, that we have government standards that identify and define um, food profile characteristics. Industry, industry trade, trade groups act as a deterrent. The need for widespread access to in, inexpensive genetic testing methods. The DNA um, capabilities are um, en enabling um, verification techniques, but um, they need to be implemented through the industry. Fraud opportunities are created by long and complicated supply chains. The allergenic potential of fraudulent ingredients is obviously incredibly important and relevant to the food safety risk profile of food fraud. So most importantly in the, in the study of food fraud is the acceptance that there's actually a public health risk here. It's not only a labelling issue in the sense of misleading conduct, although that is one particular example, that, um, but uh, Spink um, John Spink from Michigan State University has um, specifically identified that there's a potential more risk than other types of food risk because it's an unknown. There's an un such an unknown element in what can potentially contaminate a food. Um, he's also characterised the different types into the three: direct, indirect, or technical. Where a direct food risk is created by exposure to acute toxicity by a contaminant causing immediate threat to health or life from one exposure. An indirect food fraud risk can follow long-term exposure to harmful adulterants, contaminants or the omission of beneficial ingredients including preservatives and vitamins. And a technical food fraud which, which might be non-material to nature may involve false description say as to country of origin. Essential to Spink and Moyer's study of food fraud is, is assessing how the the threat differs from the more traditional food protection di disciplines of food quality. They've come up with this awesome chart that, um, that I'm probably not demonstrating as well as they do when they do their presentations, but um, the, the, to, to indicate that the, the differences in these four categories based on an intentional motive, unintentional motive, um, and whether or not there's a potential for economic gain um, and or harm. And food fraud is obviously the intentional act for economic gain. I do like this image. Like I'd indicated before from the Oceana study where you had um, 
the US identify the fact that there's a lot of feed seafood fraud um, across the country and this was at a time when there was a horse kick going on as well. So I thought that was a bit funny. I'm showing you this photo when we move into the next section of um, what's known in Australia, mainly because it's an image that was used in the UK media regarding lamb takeaways and I find it quite interesting as an Australian vegetarian um, and particularly in the, the, the reaction that was occurring in regards to food regulators in Australia when there was a European horse gate dramas. Um, they were very adamant to declare that our meat supply is free of horse um, because we have a different, we have structural regulatory differences in regards to the production of um, pet food and, and certain um, regulatory barriers that, that, that maintain um, integrity in, within our um, human supply chain in the situation of whether or not horse is introduced, mainly because we don't have many knackeries that do horses and um, but there are structural changes as well. Structural differences is the main point. But I find it fascinating how at the same time we had various other actions in Australia with um, penalty notices to butchers and things like that for having not having the right species of meat in their lamb mix or their their you know chip, chicken mince it was pork beef mince or lamb and um, so butchers are obviously being fined for for this um, um, for the mix up in in some of the cheaper meats. Um, into a into a mince. Um, it may not be horse, but it may not be lamb either. And um, you know, maybe people don't want to eat all these different species. But yeah, um, that was quite interesting in Australia. Um, going into some of the prosecutions that um, one of the state regulators, New South Wales Food Authority, was involved um, in. Now. Um, before that, we had um, Australia was in the midst of its own slaughter gate in the 80s when US officials found horse meat in Australian beef shipped to a San Diego plant. And then Australian officials had then discovered horse and kangaroo meat in boxes of beef in, bound for the US from a Melbourne export company. So that was in 1982 and we had a royal commission into the Australian meat industry and various um, Revelations had provided a catalyst for widespread changes um, and really increased penalties for substitution offences and various other things like that. Um, and although the Australia appears to have escaped the greatest of the most recent food frauds, we weren't touched by the horse meat and melamine um, very in a very small way. Um, and the enforcement data of the New South Wales Food Authority prosecuting misleading or deceptive conduct false description of food and breaches of labelling requirements in the Australian New Zealand Food Standards Code over a particular period in the last decade suggests food fraud is indeed occurring here, but regardless of whether or not the required mens rea is present, mens rea being the, um, the intent to deceive, we don't need, you can, we can um, have these prosecutions um, that I've got up on the screen here um, that may fall into the into the category of food fraud, but um, in court they don't actually require a proof of intent. Um, so whether or not these were intended substitutions um, wasn't proven necessarily in court, but they um, um, it's not necessary to do so. But for the purposes of the food fraud discussion. Um, we don't necessarily consider whether or not this present and proven the, the, the intent, um, but we've got situations where we've had Loggett's, Hoggett sold as lamb, major systematic um, uh, um, de demonstrated fraud. Um, we had a very large matter involving um, uh, bacon coming from, um, or pork coming from Denmark. Um, and it was all labelled, and in big supermarkets labelled product of Australia. Um, and quite a serious matter involving a, um, a strange little situation where a seed product had been imported from um, South America. Um, it was turned out to be toxic yellow oleander, um, but that had been sold as a slimming seed and people were losing weight. Um, it was a toxin. 
so um, people were getting very ill. But it had been sold as a candle nut seed, and um, and that required some, I think, some work to actually um, get that off the market. Um, we had, a, and I'll go into this next one. We had quite a few. Um, Australia had quite a few situations a couple of years ago with coffee, tea, chocolates, and and jellies sold as slimming foods, but they'd actually contained a pharmaceutical subutramine. Um, they were presented as um, I think I actually will. There you are. Here's some here. So um, this, I'm not sure whether the UK um, um, or other countries around the world had um, received these coffees, but um, we had quite a few um, cases of recalls here due to the undeclared presence of, of, of a um, pharmaceutical that had been actually withdrawn from the market for um, adverse effects. Um, this was also another subutramine adulterated product that um, it was uh, also contained therapeutic doses of, th of subutramine. Now it was quite interesting how you've got um, all natural claims on some of the the coffees. I remember. Um, I've also had other other you know. There's quite a few misleading matters in relation to the country of origin um, and that's quite an issue in Australia. There's a, um, a local food movement um, and we've also had stress-free Black Angus that unfortunately didn't have a verifiable traceability system. Um, also matters in relation to free range and um, those um, credence claims um, have been taken on by our big national regulator and we've had quite a few issues in relation to determining what free range eggs are um, and a number of these big companies have been significantly fined for, um, for I'll go through some of the um, egg, chicken and duck producers, uh, free range eggs and free range omega-3 eggs um, where a substantial proportion of the eggs in the labelled carton were from caged hens, free to roam in large barn claims, um, when the shed stocking density in practice inhibited abilities to move around, um, many, many other kind of claims such as open range grown, grown nature's way ducks when they're actually in um, barns and no access to grass or water. Um, these have been matters that in the last year have um, come to the uh, to the ACCC following significant consumer concern in relation to the production of and the sale labelling of eggs and whether or not people can indeed believe the claims and whether they are a substituted product. I've just um, in Australia we are only a small little country, so we do have when you know, when I look at the international or well, comparative kind of systems, it sort of feels like we you know we have a um, you know we only have a small part of the market, but um, um, the ability to to um, classify events, obviously incorporating the different types of data sources, facilitates our analysis of patterns of food frauds and adulterations. Now, this is the this is the data that we get from um, FISANS being our national regulator, who um, coordinate recalls. And they collect data on coordinated food recalls to identify common trends based on a, on a classification system involving eight categories. Now, there's no defined category for food fraud events. This is um, in comparison to the European classification system, where there's actually um, 28 classified hazards in the EU and of which 2% of the alerts from the EU <coughs> had been considered to be food fraud. And I've cut, this is information um, that's come from a, a review of the EU rapid alert system um, and it breaks down the origin of fraudulent food captured um, within that 2%. But with Australia, we don't have a food fraud identifier to determine why a recall occurred but um, you can see the, the numbers I've identified there. They're actually from the um, the 
subutramine matters of you know review of the raw data. We've got chemical contaminants here identified as such, but um, for our purposes, we wouldn't know that it was actually an intentional food fraud matter. So um, Australia needs to um, consider um, some of its more um, uh, its classification system so we can actually understand what the data means. So I've just I've just had done a bit of a run through in regards to global um, initiatives, and I just wanted to put these up. Um, for people's reference into the future, if they wanted to look further into into what international efforts have been um, taken, the um, these reports in the last year of it, it's unprecedented to have this much activity in relation to this issue. In the Elliott Review, I'll just focus on some of the government responses from the Elliott Review, identifying the the, the um, a food crime unit within the Food Standards Agency. Is to, has been established, I understand, and then also the food authenticity te testing is being ramped up, as well as coordination um, across government agencies, which is obviously a problem for most countries, um, and implementing the better intelligence. Uh, one thing that's come from the food fraud analysis and study is just the importance of of um, of the investigational um, aspects, um, skill, various agencies have had to skill up their, their investigative skill, um, skill sets. Now, in July 2014, the Global Food Safety Initiative released a paper detailing its position on food fraud mitigation. Um, the guidance details additional steps an organisation will require to take in the next full revision of the GFSI guidance document 7th edition for release in 2016. According to the paper, as I'd said, the food fraud can be more dangerous to consumers because contaminants can be unconventional and because the fraudsters don't often realise how harmful these contaminants might be. And obviously um, the melamine milk powder crisis had actually um, manifested these concerns. The GFSI have been advised um, by its food fraud think tank um, that these two steps should be, pre preventative approaches should be included into the next document. Those being a vulnerable food fraud vulnerability assessment of a, of a business system, um, processes, as well as the appropriate control measures to reduce the risks. So it's anticipated that during a food safety certification audit, an auditor will review documentation related to the vulnerability assessment and confirm that a plan has been devised and implemented. And they will also be intending to develop and publish practical guidelines for into the implementation of this over the next 18 months. The paper, GFSI paper identifies appropriate control measures. Um, the monitoring strategy, a testing strategy, in ingredient origin verification, specification management, supplier audits, and anti-counterfeit technologies. And just in the last section, I just want to focus a little bit more on that aspect. And obviously, court cases and the provision of pecuniary penalties play a useful part in the food control system, the matters that I had identified to you earlier um, in Australia, many of those did receive significant fines. Named, so the, the deterrence element is, is important, um, but to leave the control of food for two deterrents factors by judicial actions, however, overlooks the power for preventative system-based based approaches within food control systems to regulate food fraud. So I've, I've got some tips to mitigate what you can you do and with awareness enhanced by international initi initiatives. Really one could ask the question, how does a food safety manager mitigate intentional adulteration, substitution or the false description of food or ingredients? 
and most food safety programs and HACCP control from unintended has uh, from unintentional hazards such as microbial, chemical, or physical threatening the food safety profile of a food. The intentional activities for economic gain are less likely to have been considered in your current risk and hazard assessments. And the GFSI guideline benchmarking document will require companies to identify the vulnerabilities and assistance will be available online from any providers depending on where your company is located. Currently the USP expert panel on food ingredients intentional adulterants is proposing a new guidance on food fraud mitigation. This proposed guidance is published at the moment for public comment until the end of this month. The USP website states the purpose of the new guidance document is to offer a framework for the food industry and regulators to develop and implement preventative management systems to deal specifically with food fraud. So I've come to the end of my presentation but I'm providing um, references to a lot of the, the data for people who want to actually look further um, as well as the reference and the link here to the USP guidance on food fraud mitigation. And thank you. I hope that was um, useful for people. Hello. Uh, can you Hello. hear me? I, yes, I can. Um, yeah, it was very useful, Janine. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, it was a great primer again. Um, Food fraud is a, is a, you can tell by all the different think tanks that are working on it, uh, GFSI included, and also how we've seen standards such as BRC, SQF uh, expanding their requirements to include food fraud, etc. It's going to be a massive uh, issue over the next few years, so it's better to be ahead of the curve rather than a, a late adopter. Um, I, at this point, uh, I invite um, audience uh, members to, to submit submit the questions. We uh, I've already picked up a, a few, but I'll start with uh, uh, what's becoming sort of a uh, regular now. It's Simon's uh, silly question of the day. Um, I actually bought the other day a, a smoothie from um, a motorway service station and. Uh, it was very nice. Uh, by the way, uh, Janine, you can stop sharing your um, PowerPoint now. Yeah, so I bought I, I bought a smoothie the other day in good faith, um, and it was it was some exotic flavour. It was something like kiwi, lemon, and wheatgrass, and and uh, I, you know it tasted lovely. I must say it was really refreshing. But then I, I looked on the ingredients on the back, and it said the, the apple and banana. I mean. That's not fraud, is it? I suppose it's. I don't know what what that is. What would you what? classify that as, Janine? So, so what was the list of ingredients? Uh, well, uh, on the front of the pack of the bottle, it said kiwi, uh, something like kiwi, lemon, and wheatgrass. You know, something exotic like that. And it tasted very nice, I must say. But then when I looked on the the ingredients, the it said apple and banana, and and things like the kiwi was way down and. You know, it wasn't a main ingredient, so it was, it was have, basically, yeah. We have a, for that situation. We have a um, requirement for characterising ingredient percentage under the new new food labelling laws. Do you have such a requirement? Because in that circumstance, when you two turn over the back, um, you can identify the percentage, um, but. We have also had examples here in Australia with uh, um, apple and blackcurrant juice, where um, it was actually called blackcurrant and apple, and um, even though the apple was at eighty percent compared to the blackcurrant, but that company was actually required to change it around to be apple and blackcurrant. Right. So there are, um, yeah, depending on what your um, Labeling requirements are for yeah. characterizing ingredients. That's mm. one way of validating, um, yeah, the yeah. knowing exactly how much is in the mix. And yeah. if they don't do it properly, 
Yeah, I suppose, I mean, nobody's going to get hurt with something like that. I mean, it's there's different levels like, like you showed before with that matrix that uh, obviously people can look at when they see your, your slides. Is sort of unintentional, intentional, and, and probably something that's going to harm people or not harm people. And people always try and push the boundaries and save money and add this or that. And but there comes a point where it becomes a risk to the consumer or, or, or outright fraud. Um, so anyway, let's get some of these. Uh, it, was it that silly? The question. It, I mean, it, it is. No, you know, no, that's too <laughs> It is related. Um, Anyway, uh, uh, Yolande has asked, uh, should chocolate factories test for melamine if they use powdered milk? What, is, what, do you think that would be a, a reasonable thing to expect or, or not? I think the, well, if the um, actual, yeah, the, 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 your, your, your supplies would have to have gone through some sort of quality check. Um, depending yeah. on yeah, so I suppose uh, really y y there's a, a whole range of things that could be thrown into there, couldn't they? I mean, melamine's just one. It's got mm. to be an it's got to be an absence of uh, of any any anything, hasn't it? Ra rather than just specifically melamine. And 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 what you okay. what you're saying is obviously start with your supplier. Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, also, somebody said, uh, uh, is, should, "Is food fraud classified as a, a, a in terms of hazards, a biological, a chemical, or a physical?" Or, 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 it's that's a, I haven't actually gone into that end uh, aspect of it, but um, many of the researchers um, actually consider. Uh, the the criminality of the crime, um, the behaviours as being risk factors, um, and uh, as a po it's not a biological, it's not a physical, it's not a chemical risk as per the traditional food safety uh, systems consider it, um, consider risks and hazards. Um, but for uh, food fraud, the risks are different, and um, many. A international um, work, say for instance, um, in the UK is looking at things like um, actually becoming aware of when a, um, a particular food is becoming vulnerable for a substitution. For instance, say if there was a um, in there was something recently in where Pakistan had various swathes of. of um, areas of walnut production had been. Um, destroyed in some weather incidents so then peanuts became a, a risky substitute and so mm -hmm. um, so the aspect so some of the risks that can be um, considered are uh, um, say environmental influences and um, the cost of, of meat for instance so the yeah. risks are different for systematic control and it's constantly changing and evolving and depending on circumstances so it's moving goalposts <laughs> all the time. Indeed. And yeah. so now the UK are, do, are taking proactive work at some, um, alerting people to, to some of these risks that may or may never eventuate but um, it's changing the culture of how we think about it. Yeah that's a good idea. Um, well T Tabitha actually pointed out the BRC actually has substitution or fraud listed as a separate hazard in clause 3.5.1.1. So they're, they're dealing with it that way. Uh, let's have a mm -hmm. look see if we've got anything else. Uh, if you find or suspect food fraud for a product or material, who is the reporting body and should there be a documented procedure for reporting? I suppose does that depend on the country? Uh, mm. um, yeah. Uh, I suppose that, yeah. I mean, in the UK, the you know the Food Standards Agency in Australia would it be just F Sans for Sans? Um, you know, that that's normally the body. I, I don't think there are separate bodies for food fraud at the moment, or, or not. I don't know, Janine. Do you know? No, no. There's not. Not in Australia anyway. And there's no. Um, no, they don't. He, yeah. Okay, let's see if there's anything else on here. Uh, 
How much info is required to update HACCP plan hazard risk assessment? Well, that's how long is a piece of string, I suppose, mm. isn't it? Uh, great job. I wish you had uh, longer and more information. Hope to speak again. Okay, that's great, Ron. Uh, okay, here's, here's another one. We buy manufactured ingredients, chocolate. We've sent it out for identification testing, but it's very difficult for a lab to analyze complex ingredients. How much should we push our suppliers to provide information about the raw material, uh, the raw ingredient qualification and testing process, especially with vendors we've been dealing with for many years? Um, oh, that's uh, that's yeah, that, that's a question for your business. But um, yeah, yeah, how, yeah. How much risk do you want to take? But um, I suppose it's part of the picture, and it part of the picture is supplier information, specifications, certificates of yes. analysis, certificates of conformity for all suppliers for all ingredients, and yeah. and, and and based on that, you know, if some supplier won't divulge certain information, you've got to be concerned, haven't you? I suppose. Yes. Uh, and yes. it's work it working closely with these suppliers. Yes. Uh, should it be included in HACCP? Well. Well. Well, yeah. that's 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 the that's definitely the um, the frame in which it will be included. Yeah. Blimey, the, the, there are there are a lot of questions coming. Uh, is it really possible for a distributor to test all the products to ensure compliance? We request letters of guarantee, specifications, allergen declarations, label verification. I find it cumbersome to test all products for their composition and percentages of yeah. ingredients. Well, these are all these, yeah. The, these are all considerations based on the risk of the product that you're receiving, um, mm. and as much as, um, yeah, the the requesting of the specification materials is obviously part of your um, insurances. But um, yeah, how long's a piece of string? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, it, it, you know. An auditing, going visiting your suppliers, I suppose, knowing who your suppliers are, um, becomes difficult, doesn't it? As as extended supply chains as well, you know, um, overseas, uh, and hence things like F Food Safety Modernisation Act and looking at um, imports and things like that. Um, and anti counterfeit techniques anti counterfeit yeah that's um I would have to um, suggest that you look at some of the data from um, Michigan State University John Spink and his particular area in regards to um, um, the criminality aspects and some of the work that they've done on the more of the anti counterfeit work that's not necessarily associated with food as well but um, yeah it's not necessarily my um, specific expertise, but um, Americans are doing a lot of work around that. Yeah. And Andrea's asked if all of our suppliers have GFSI certification of some type, should should that be sufficient, or should we get more information from them? Oh, well, if nice you believe them. If it was as easy as that, again, it's just one piece of the pie, isn't it? I suppose. You know. Mm -hmm. I, have have this has the supplier got GFSI some sort of GFSI certification? Are they being audited by a third party regularly? Uh, have we been and audited them ourselves, or even had a look, a go and look and see? Maybe not a full audit. Have we got specs? Have we got certificates? Uh, you, the, it's filling in a, a patch patchwork. Um, that's all you can do. But there are, I mean, are there anywhere that you know of, Janine, uh, sort of templates that help to go through the process of? of well, see, this is yeah, this is exactly what um, what um, GFSI and USP have are coming up with is practical practical guidance um, that will soon be published. Like I, uh, um, I think I've provided the link for the USP. They will have soon publications in relation to um, helping helping people do these assessments and yeah. identifying their controls and what in with what what parameters that they need to be considering. Yeah. Um, that's but that's yeah definitely coming forward. Okay. okay. Right. Okay. Let's just see if there's any more. Uh, da, da, da. 
No, I think for now, unless I've missed some scrolling down, unless anybody else has got any any questions, no. I think we've come to the end. What what I'll do anyway, uh, Janine, is um, I'll I'll capture all those comments and and go through them, and we'll we'll post them on the IFSQM forum. And if there, if there are any gaps, um, and we can follow up on them uh, later, can't we? Mm -hmm. um, okay, I think I think it's time for your bedtime. Actually, perhaps indeed it is. Think. It's been uh, it's been really great having you with us today. Um, I've enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a real topical topic, definitely, and um, it's going to it's it's not going away. It's, it's just going to grow bigger. So it's it's really gets people, even if it's an, an initial to get people thinking and exploring further uh, information that's available yeah yes. so that's smash smashing so thanks very much Janine thank uh, you very much you're done now on behalf of uh, all the IFSQM members really great and thanks very much thank and you're coming back thank you're you very much in, no problem you're coming back in August Janine is that right yes I'll be doing another one on health claims yes brilliant all right thanks for now Janine take thank care thank you have a nice okay. weekend bye bye um, you too bye bye okay now um at this time of the uh, presentation, we uh, load the certificate um, for the attendees. So hopefully, um, this technology can be very, very clunky. Um, the poll has not worked this week, which is very disappointing. Hopefully, the certificate, if you look in the pop-in tab at the top, uh, hopefully you can get that. So if you don't get it, as you know, we send an email out. A uh, couple of days after today's webinar, we'll send you an email with the certificate, the uh, link to the video recording, and the slides. And if you have any questions, you can always head over to the IFSQM forum and pop your questions or comments or feedback there. So thanks for your attendance today. Uh, it's been another good session. Next week, like I say, we're talking about um, improving training, uh, spreading that throughout the organization to make our um, emergency preparedness and emergency response uh, better and uh, more real, uh, which is really a, a critical thing to do. So I'm sure Vladimir, Vladimir will have some great tips for us next week. So uh, apart from that, uh, all there is to say is um, Thanks for your attendance and have a lovely weekend. Take care.